Good morning, everyone. My name is Josh Alpert. I'm a member of the Southern California Teaching Committee and chair for this year's SCPGA Youth Teaching and Coaching Summit Virtual Series. Welcome to our third session. Today's discussion surrounds the junior golfer journey and some perspective uh, from our game's best leaders, coaches, and players. Um, so really appreciative to have the panel we have this, uh, this morning. A little business before we get started. Um, I think at the bottom or the right hand side of your guys' screens, uh, for those of you listening in, there is a question bar. If you have any questions about the subject matter or for any one of our panelists, uh, feel free to, to pop that in uh, and we'll do our best to answer the questions as we roll through. Um, we will also do a golf trivia segment uh, and it is, uh, we did that last time. Congrats again to Alan and Heidi, our first ever uh, <laughs> Uh, trivia winners from last week. We have three questions lined up. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll see if we can get some new winners. Um, but today, uh, the, we have an SCPGA blanket, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Nikki, I don't know if you could confirm if this is limited edition or not, but uh, it's a it's a it's fine very blanket. Limited. Very, limited very edition, limited. Fine blanket. So, okay. So for our introduction today, um, and I'm just going to play this. I understand we had some technical difficulties. So if this goes through, great. Uh, you will be listening to the background of the Chicago Bulls introduction music. Um, so if you guys can't hear it, I'm sorry, but I'm just going to roll through introduction to it. <laughs> this former Oklahoma State Cowboy golfer and unapologetic Dallas Cowboy fan once won a pineapple in a heated shipping match using a snag club at a KPNZ clinic at the downtown Los Angeles office. He is the SCPGA Chief Operating Officer, Nikki Gass. <laughs> a list of accolades, follow that redwood tree, and we did some pruning. This panelist is the LPGA National Vice President, the PGA LPGA Master Professional, former LPGA National Teacher of the Year, former Southern California PGA Teacher of the Year, and our section best female golfer in her own right, Allison Kurz. <laughs> Our final panelist broke the NCAA record for most tournament wins at Stanford with nine. She was a two-time U.S. Women's Am semifinalist, former number one amateur golfer in the world, and played in six majors on the LPGA Tour as an amateur. She doesn't need a lot of cereal, but when she does, she prefers cinnamon toast stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrea Lee! <laughs> I think we have a new starter for section events. <laughs> oh, that'd be great. Okay, the music just wants to keep going. Okay, there we go. I'm done having fun. Thanks, folks. Appreciate you humoring me. Um, okay, so welcome everybody. We're going to dive right in. Bryce, if you could slide to the next. Uh, just a, in, in brief, um, starting with Nikki, if you could just give us a little background into uh, your life and career playing the game of golf to present. Well, thanks, Josh. Um, thanks for the great intro. And uh, first, just want to publicly thank you for you taking a hold of these Youth uh, youth Summit virtual series. Uh, you've done an amazing job um, on behalf of your fellow uh, section members. So thank you for that. And uh, thanks for asking me to be included with these two other great panelists. Um, I grew up around the game. My father is a, a PGA Live member. So was the, the country club kid that just you know was exposed to it from, from birth, essentially. Um, was introduced to the game at the age of five. Um, really didn't didn't take to golf <clears throat> specifically until probably 11 or 12 years old. You know, did did other sports and other activities um, like most kids do and should. Um, and then just really gravitated to to golf um, and really started you know honing in on the focus. Um, you know, going into high school and certainly in high school, um, played junior golf, played Southern California junior golf. Uh, grew up in the desert at that time, and uh, just had a wonderful time, as all of us had uh, during our junior golf days. I uh, was extremely fortunate and, and glad that I played at the time that I did, because um, it wasn't as competitive as it is now, and I know we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes, but was fortunate enough to, uh, to be recruited to play collegiate golf. That was my ultimate goal um, as a kid, and uh, as you mentioned, uh, Oklahoma State cowgirl golfer, Cowboys. <laughs> you know, I love cowboys. Uh, 
anyway, uh, amazing time as, as both Allison and Andrea can attest to, to our college golf days. Uh, what an incredible experience. Probably didn't know how well and, and easy and lucky we had it <laughs> until we left <laughs> and had to, uh, had to get into the real world. But um, unbelievable experience, you know, certainly had, had hopes and dreams of, of being the next Nancy Lopez, but, but that didn't pan out and, and realized quickly, quickly that that wasn't going to pan out. Um, so I really gravitated back to what I knew and loved. You know, I studied broadcast journalism in, in school, did some internships, just really found out that that wasn't going to be the career path for me. So I gravitated back to what I knew and what I loved, and that was golf. Uh, my first real golf job, even though I'd been working in golf shops since I could see over the counter, um, starting at Wood Ranch, which is where uh, Allison is now. Uh, great times and great experiences um, working alongside uh, section, current section members now that I've known since I was a kid. But anyway, my first real job out of school was at Mission Hills Country Club. Uh, I've worked on on Keowa Island in South Carolina. And, and then honestly, I, I really... Um, you know, I, I was lucky and fortunate to find my passion, and that was in the, the administration side of the game, and, and was fortunate fortunate in 1998 to uh, to come to this come work for the section um, in junior golf as junior golf director. And um, other than a, a few years here and there for having babies and going to a little stint working for the PGA of America, I've been with the section since '98 and uh, in various roles, and uh, really just enjoy every minute of what I do. Uh, every day is different. Um, you know, I, 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 my time spent working in junior golf and, and our junior tour were some of the best of my career, you know, um, the most rewarding, uh, to be able to work with young people and see them excel, certainly as golfers, but more importantly as, as young men and women. So to be able to still be connected in some sort, uh, is, is wonderful. And then to be able to, to work with our PJ members and, and some of which uh, were former junior golfers is, is really pretty cool. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Thanks, Nikki. Um, Allison? So I actually started golf um, strictly out of jealousy. So I grew up in Missouri and I was really jealous that my brother and my dad could do sports together. Um, and in my area, sports didn't start for, for kids until the age of eight. And so by the age of seven, I was rearing to go antsy, wanting to do a sport, and um, kids weren't even allowed on the golf course until the age of eight, junior golf didn't start then. So he would sneak me out on the golf course, and I kind of felt like this rebel that I was, you know, breaking the rules and being able to be with dad out on the course and just really grew to love the game. And so as soon as I turned eight, was involved at my club's junior golf program and then got involved with more competitive tournaments by the age of 10 or 11 and had a really great mentor who um, always challenged me to play against better players and would always put me in age groups um, above me. And so she, uh, her name is Carol Frommuth, and some of you may know her from St. Louis. She's um, been, been wonderful in the golf industry for girl golfers particularly. Um, had me experience a lot of failure early on to build up grit, to build up that challenge to overcome adversity. And so really just took to the game, um, enjoyed playing competition, but was a multi-sport athlete, played uh, basketball and track and field and softball and swimming and just a whole bunch of everything. And then by the time I got to high school, I narrowed it down to three sports because in Missouri, we're very seasonal. So you play the sport that coincides with the season. And um, for me, that was golf, basketball and track and was lucky enough to secure a full ride to Florida State. What really secured that ride was seeing my first palm tree. And um, when I saw a palm tree, I knew I was close to the ocean and I was like, sign me up, I wanna go here. Um, had a decent career at Florida State, was a two-time academic All-American, but certainly didn't play to the level that I had anticipated. I kind of had this um, being a small fish in a big pond sort of syndrome where everybody was really good and we were playing against Duke and national champions week after week. Um, so it was quite a challenge. And so I quickly realized that playing professionally probably wasn't going to happen for me right after college. So I was involved in the PGM program so that I could include golf in my life and potentially make it a career when I thought I was in college. And that led me to an internship out to the West of Mission Hills in Palm Springs and um, actually did one of my levels under Barry Clayton. So he was kind of one of my first people to um, teach me how to teach, if you will. And I was stuck in the industry ever since. So um, 
been, been proud to be PGA adjunct faculty where I can go back into the colleges and sort of share my story coming up through PGM programs. And what was interesting enough is the minute that I let go of becoming a professional golfer, that was the minute that I was able to start playing in professional events on the LPGA Tour. Um, and so I had played in six majors and hopefully we'll play in KPMG this year whenever they reschedule it, if they do. Um, so it's kind of interesting how that moment that I let go of that idea, that dream um, became a reality. So um, that's sort of my golfing story. I still, still love competing and then of course full-time teacher um, helping students with the physical side and the mental side. Alton, that's awesome. Thank you. Andrea. Yeah, so my dad uh, introduced me to the game when I was five. Um, as an only child, they kind of got me started in a whole different, whole, whole bunch of things like piano, um, played soccer for six years. I got my black belt in Taekwondo. So I did pretty much everything um, as a kid. I loved snowboarding. I did ice skating. Um, so very versatile. Um, and, you know, I took up golf and my dad um, took me to the lakes at El Segundo where Josh is at and I got my first lesson because um, he didn't want me to you know start off golf with a bad swing if he taught me himself so <laughs> that was really smart on his part um, but yeah I just I loved it ever since I you know grabbed the club really and I started playing competitively in SEPGA um, since I was eight years old. I did a lot of summer camps um, at the lakes at Dominguez Hills so that was really fun you know just to um, you know play with girls and boys that were around my age and I think that was a really good and fun experience right off the bat for me as a kid um, which I really enjoyed. And then, yeah, started competing when I was eight, um, played the CPGA and then the Toyota Tour Cup uh, series for a little bit and then competed at the EJGA uh, starting when I was 12 years old um, and, you know, traveled all over the country for junior tournaments, which was super fun and um, played all these amazing golf courses all over the country, which um, was a really tremendous experience for a kid like me and that, that's when I really started focusing on just golf and um, I kind of quit everything else and just focused my time on you know playing the sport that I wanted to pursue and um, you know played high school golf and won state championship with my team I think it was my uh, yeah my senior year my last year which was really special and um, you know I still keep in touch with a couple of the girls on on the team and they're a couple of my best friends so that was a really great experience in itself and um, you know throughout my junior golf days I wasn't really thinking about college I was so young but you know gradually the topic of college came about and I was getting recruited which was a super exciting period for me um, and I was you know debating between SC, UCLA and Stanford I really wanted to stay in California I couldn't leave the weather so um, you know, and I ended up at Stanford, which has been, you know, the best four years of my life, really. And, um, you know, I really learned how to become a part of a team and really embrace a team culture that, you know, I never knew before because um, golf is such an individual sport. So I really learned a lot from, you know, being part of a college team and, you know, just really growing as a person and as a golfer. Um, so, that experience was incredible. Um, I'm really sad that, you know, I wasn't able to, you know, be on campus this final senior spring. I was really looking forward to it. Um, but, you know, under the current circumstances, it's just not possible. But, um, but yeah, but the last three and a half years have been some of the best. Um, and yeah, and this year I, you know, earned my LPGA tour card for the year and um, you know, unfortunately, season's on hold, but really looking forward to getting back out there. And um, I had my first two events at the beginning of the year in Australia and made the cuts in both of them. So that was exciting. Um, so I'm really looking forward to being back out there. But yeah, it's, my golf story is not as long as the other two panelists, but um, it's getting there. <laughs> it will be one day. <laughs> um, Bryce, you want to slide through here? Just uh, move it forward. Um, and I think we got a little bit of it here, um, you know, just the access into the game then and now. Um, Nikki, I think that, that you had mentioned 
Um, was your initial experience, was it girls and boys were on the, you, you had to play on the same high school team or was it a separate sport? Yeah, so as the elder of the three panelists, um, you know, I, I played my junior golf days in the in the 80s, essentially graduated high school in 1990. So, um, yeah, we didn't we didn't have a you know girls high school golf uh, then. So if you wanted to play, you you teed it up with the boys. Which, you know, in hindsight, although I'm I'm certainly thrilled of of how we've advanced and and all the great opportunities we have and all the girls teams that we have. Uh, for me personally, I wouldn't I wouldn't have changed a thing because I think it made me better. You know, I had to work harder. Uh, we had to play the same tees. Um, you know, I'm not a long hitter to begin with, um, and then especially competing against uh, you know 17 or 18 year old boys um, really had to hone in that short game. So you know, for me personally, um, I loved it, and and again, it pushed me to to be better. Um, I remember, you know, in my junior golf days, and, and I tried to get some some actual numbers from NGF, but maybe they don't go go back that far. But, you know, it, my my best guesstimate is that, and again, this is just for from experience and what I remember. You know, it was probably 10, maybe not even 15 percent were were girls. If you look at all of junior golfers, and then, you know, as we progressed into the 90s, that number grew a little bit, but. You know, always sort of hovered around 20%. And I, I remember even late 90s, early 2000s, when I was involved with our junior golf tour, it was always right around 20%. You know, I remember one year we hit maybe 22% and got, got really excited. But, you know, to now see where we've come, um, you know, everyone knows we're right around 24 million golfers. Um, junior golfers make up just over two and a half million <clears throat> of all golfers. Uh, which is like 11% or something like that, uh, which is which is phenomenal. And then out of those two and a half million, 36% of all junior golfers now are girls. I mean, to me, that is just phenomenal. I mean, that that's certainly more than double uh, of when I played in in the 80s. You know, as a junior golfer, um, I know that number is is a national number, but that's really consistent with what we're seeing uh, within our SCPJ Junior Tour. Um, I know PJ Junior League that most of you are so familiar with um, that really caters to that, you know, I would say eight to 12 year old age range. Um, you know, they're they're between 25 and 30 percent girls participation, which I think is really important because Junior League and, and programs like that. And I know we're going to talk about LPGA girls golf as well. Those are great introduction points to the game, you know, and, and they may be sort of trying it out. And do I want to go the competitive route or do I just want to play for fun? And, you know, it's really a, a tremendous opportunity for us in the industry, whether we're golf administrators putting on these tournaments and programs or instructors and, and coaches like Allison. Uh, it's really a great opportunity for us to show them all the great benefits of the game. Yes, you can you can be very focused and competitive and, and go a certain route like Andrea has gone. But, but also, you know, there's a great opportunity to just play this game for the rest of your life and, you know, certainly all the, the life skills that it, that it teaches. But I'm just so thrilled and excited to, to see these numbers grow, not only for junior golf as a whole, but, but specifically for, for girls. So it's yeah, phenomenal. I think, uh, Bryce, click slide forward. I think, Allison, these next two slides, I think you'd put this together. Does that pretty much speak to what Nikki was talking about? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think from my perspective, most of my junior career was in the 90s. Um, high school was the late 90s. Um, that there, for me, there wasn't a lot of access to girls specific junior golf programs. So um, it was just mixed in with the boys. And I think the only um, difficult thing for me as a young golfer, you know, being 9, 10, 11, is maybe only having one female in, in the group or um, maybe being the only female. And that's really not that much different sometimes at, at section stuff or in tournaments um, or in other PGA events. Um, but it's great to see now how there's been an evolution and a growth for more girl-specific programs, um, even just for young girls to see female mentors, um, to see female teachers, to see female leaders. I think that's really, really interesting. And some of these stats I pulled from the USGA LPGA Girls Golf Program, um, which is specific for girl golfers um, age 7 to, to 18, and to think that in 95, um, there, only 17% of all junior golfers were actually girls. And as Nikki said, now it's up to 36%. I think that's that's fantastic. Um, and also girls are coming into the game at a much younger age. And I think part of that is from US Kids Golf. 
having clubs and equipment that are accessible to young kids and not just having an adult club cut down that's too heavy and too long for a kid, but um, clubs that are specific to boys and girls, uh, junior golfers, I think that's um, something that's certainly helping access to equipment, access to good coaching. Um, and I think this is a really cool stat. So if I look at, um, I've actually been playing golf now for um, 30 years. So in that, the entire span that I've played golf, um, 800,000 girls have moved through the LPGA, USGA girls golf program. I think that's a, an awesome, awesome number. And from that, there's 45 plus members that play on LPGA and Symmetra Tour. Names such as Brittany Lincecum, Cheyenne Woods, Mariah Stackhouse. Um, so Andrew, you probably are familiar with Mariah up in Stanford. Those girls went through uh, the girls program, which I think is really, really cool. I would have loved to have that when I was young. Um, but again, like Nikki said, I probably wouldn't change my experience uh, for the world because it's actually made me comfortable being in a group, being the only one. Um, but really cool to see the access to different programs for girl golfers. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, it's just to you know, like, for me to see the to see the growth in the game from these perspectives and 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 specific to to, to women's golf is, um, you know, I mean that that we are where we are is tremendous, and I just think uh, the the future moving forward with the initiatives that we have at place at the national and section level. Um, on, on those levels to support what, you know, what a lot of us do at our own sites in our individual ways um, really should lead us to, to much, great, much greater numbers moving forward. Um, and there was a couple of questions in here. Um, uh, well, actually, you know what, real quickly, I'm gonna do just, I always forget to do this and this is a lot of people's favorite parts of this. We have a three trivia question part series. So I'm gonna ask the first uh, trivia question. If you guys have the answer, pop it into the answer bar here. Um, first person to answer will win the first SCPGA blanket limited edition, um, and you can wash them. Question number one, name the last three Masters winners in order, starting with the most recent. Last three Masters winners in order, starting with the most recent. And maybe, uh, should I address one of these questions while everyone's uh, submitting their, yes. their correct answers? Uh, so yeah. Bob Matson asked, uh, is the expense of AJGA prohibitive for anyone, for juniors? Is there a workaround? Um, I would say, you know, tough, tough question. It's junior golf, and, and I would say really um, once you get to a very highly competitive level for any sport, it, it's costly. You know, I had a daughter that played club soccer, and I mean, I, insane, right? Um, I, I'm going to refer to to what we've done at the section level with the creation of the Toy to Tour Cup, and we created that in 1999. The the main reason we created that, and it was the vision of Tom Sargent at the time, was uh, to create a local experience similar to what kids would get on a national level, because we had so much talent here in Southern California. Uh, we wanted to create opportunities, competitive opportunities for our kids, so they wouldn't have to leave, they wouldn't have to travel across the country to get that same experience. And, you know, over 20 years later, we've seen that tour grow into something that uh, that rivals uh, a national tour. And, and maybe Andrea can speak to that as she's as she's a product of that tour. And uh, the recognition that it gets on a national level, the recognition it gets from uh, collegiate coaches uh, is phenomenal. We've had so many, so many wonderful kids come through that program. Yes, some have gone on to become tour players, which is amazing. Uh, but so many more have gone on to um, to go to college and, and play golf um, in college and get a degree and now are successful uh, with their careers. So um, there are there are grant programs as well. Bob, I know AJGA has a, a what they call an ACE grant um, to help families uh, because they certainly I know they don't want to prohibit a, a junior golfer from playing in those events. Um, we actually have a grant program through our foundation that we assist many families um, through the process. The last thing we want is for some young um, girl or boy that has a lot of talent um, and needs the exposure to not be able to play due to financial hardship. So uh, we've given thousands and thousands of dollars to, to support that. Um, so I don't know, Andrea, maybe just a couple of minutes on, on your experiences the, um, in Toyota Tour Cup specifically. Yeah, I mean, growing up in Southern California, I think was 
you know, super great competitively. I mean, there are so many great young golfers in Southern California, and I think that really helped me um, grow as a as a player early on. And yeah, the Toyota Tour Cup Series was um, really competitive, and you know, I ended up winning the I think the end of the year championship when I was 12, and that was kind of my highlight up until then um, was winning that tournament. Um, yeah, there are just so many great young golfers in the area um, that really helped me um, in my early years of my career to be able to, you know, go to the next stage at the AJGA at the national level um, and to really thrive there. And because, you know, I mean, California was, yeah, probably one of the most competitive and best, you know, states to compete um, in the state. So. Um, yeah, I think that really helped propel me in my junior career for sure. Yeah, I think that the, um, you know, certainly to see the, the, the numbers of, uh, you know, the numbers of tournaments that are available through the SCPGA, through, um, through all the things that Smeal does, uh, down in San Diego, California junior golf tour locally. Um, one of the things I'm also, uh, encouraged by looking at the numbers, um, I'm the JDT obviously does a fantastic job of it. Um, uh, with uh, th through the California Junior Golf Tour with Dan Martin and John Ray Leary, I, I, I support the entry level events and and I and there's a lot more of those that I've seen sprouting around, um, and I think that's extremely encouraging that we we have tournament series at the base level uh, where the masses of the golfers sit, which are more aimed at at, at it being an experience versus winning and losing, um, and I just think you know from the from a presentation standpoint in our game, we do an, a tremendous job of high level events that get you rankings that allow you to get into colleges and do those things. Um, I think that we're getting a lot better at offering tournaments where quite frankly, it isn't about pursuing college golf and those things. Golf is just a game that we should all be enjoying, whether you're great, good, bad, or indifferent. Um, and our ability to offer tournaments where quite frankly, the objective isn't to win and lose. Uh, but it's just to have the experience of playing organized golf. A uh, PGA Junior League, obviously, is, is just the you know the, the the staple of that from a national perspective. Um, but I I think we got to continue to really focus on that layer as as well. It's not as sexy as the as the high rankings and seeing your name in a newspaper. But but it's really about getting kids to play golf uh, for the right reasons, which is just for for the for the fun and the love of it. So I'm really encouraged by the the growth of both sides of it, at the high and the low level. With respect to, um, I think we had it on the slide before, we were looking at um, the PGA, um, the, the ADM model, PGA.coach. Um, this is just basically listing out uh, sort of how, the, how you, you would start and, and move through those sections. Um, you want to just give a, a real brief, uh, I know that a lot of people on this call understand it, there's some that probably don't, but just, you know, what's the objective and what are the levels for, and then uh, we can get into some questions. Yeah, so ADM, American Development Model, um, it's really developing long-term athletes, you know, long-term athletic development. Um, you know, we, we introduced this, the PGA, uh, in 2019 um, through what we call PGA.coach. And so that's uh, it's online uh, certification. If you haven't done so, I really recommend it, especially now that you've got some extra time. It takes you about two or three hours to go through the certification process, and it really shows you, you know, from every age and skill, um, how to develop golfers, and, and I know Allison will speak to this. So she's she's the expert, and and was uh, you'll you'll see her in uh, in all these certification videos as you go through the process. But you know it's something that's been developed by USA Hockey, USA Lacrosse, uh, United States Olympic Committee. Um, so it's really it's really just about creating lifelong athletes and and lifelong golfers. Um, again, going to the point, hey, do you want to just play golf, you know, for the rest of your life as a recreation? That's great. Um, do you want to get to the highest level of, of competition? That's great too. And so this arms all of our instructors and coaches um, with that training uh, specifically to, to help golfers of all ages um, through that. Allison, did you want to expand on that at all? 
I think the only thing to expand on is really um, how nicely these categories fit into um, human development. So, and I think that's that's one of the nice parts about the American development model is also looking at the psychology of the human development of kids and what's appropriate. So if you have a five-year-old in front of you, is it really appropriate to be talking about grip alignment, posture, club face angle, club plane? Or is that something that's more appropriate for someone who's 11 to 15, for example? Um, so what's nice is that these are psychologically appropriate um, for human development, and I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, you know, along those lines, uh, that, that it spells that out so clearly for us as instructors is certainly helpful. Um, and then as we develop our programs, just to keep those things in mind, if, if we have younger kids and we understand, to your point, that the goal is to have fun, um, let's make sure that we keep that that central to what those to what those classes are like. Um, hey, Josh, I would like to. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I know you're going to announce the winner. I was just going to say that there is one specific uh, instruction question. So since we're on the the teaching of the game, maybe um, Allison could answer this. It comes from Charles Delory, who I know is uh, oversees the first T chapter in the Coachella Valley. Um, Sensitive question, but thank you for asking it, Charles. Uh, as a male instructor, how do you politely address set up with a female student? Depending on the age, I think um, we're gonna get to that in a few minutes about the psychology of coaching and looking at some of the generalizations of gender differences. Um, if you're talking about a small girl, maybe you can clarify in the chat. Um, I think that is going to be pretty generic to teaching any junior. If you're teaching a woman, um, I, I think that we've talked about this in some of our previous teaching and coaching summits, um, is reframing some of the words to use that are just kind of gender neutral. Um, but I, I think that when you're standing face on with a student, um, certainly always asking for permission to touch if you want to manipulate their hands, if you want to manipulate the golf club or shift their shoulders in a particular way um, from a male coming to a female. And also, I would say from a female coming to a male, I always ask for permission to touch first. And I'll say, is it OK if I touch your shoulders and maybe this way or I want to modify your grip a little bit? Is it OK if I move your hands? Um, I don't know how we're going to address that in this current climate uh, with COVID. We probably may not do that for a while and may have to use our words differently. Um, but I think permission to touch is first, uh, first and foremost of importance. Yeah, thanks for that, for sure. Um, I'm just so there was another question uh, sort of related to the model. Um, uh, I think for Andrea and, and, and panel as well, when you first started um, how much time did you spend on range and on the course, um, you know, and, and how did you, uh, how does your time evolve now as, as you've kind of progressed through the game? How much time practicing playing and, and what do you do now? Yeah, for sure. I think when I was younger and just, you know, first starting the game, it was all for fun. You know, I never really took it seriously until I was probably, you know, 10 to 12 years old um, when I was really competing. Um, but I just loved going out to the range and playing on the golf course with my dad on the weekends and just having fun. I don't think there was a certain amount of hours that I put in, um, you know, from age five to, you know, eight. Um, I guess the more I fell in love with the game and the more I wanted to play competitively and try to win tournaments is when I started to focus on, you know, what should I practice on? What, um, how am I going to get the most out of my practice? Um, and so, I think I, I probably spent around an hour each hitting balls and, you know, practicing short game and putting when I was younger. And then, you know, gradually when I started, um, you know, competing at the Toyota Tour Cup Series and the AJGA, uh, I really put in a lot of time, I think. Um, but I think short game is really important. Um, I've heard that, or my dad always tells me that 80% of the game is short game. Um, which I, you know, I agree. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time in my short game, probably maybe two hours um, every time I'd go out there to practice and an hour on the range. So, um, and then I, you know, love playing on the golf course. I would highly recommend that, you know, anyone who really wants to improve, you know, take their skills from the range to the, to the golf course, because that's where it really matters at the end of the day it's you know you're playing it's you against the course so I think that's really important um I, I played a ton you know you know every other day I'd either play at the, the lakes and I was gonna know or just a small par three course or just go play nine um and on the weekends I'd play 18 with my dad and 
<laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was the fun part about it. And then when I, I guess throughout high school and now, I, I don't think my practice regime has really changed that much. Um, you know, I put in the time, probably, you know, an hour, hour and a half on the range and uh, a couple hours still on the short game. So um, I think it really depends on, you know, what you feel like you need to work on yourself um, and just try and get out of your comfort zone. Um, you know, if you really want to, you know, take it to the next level. Thanks. Um, that's awesome. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Allison a little bit about scholarships here in just a second, but I would like to acknowledge Justin Height. Uh, he was our first winner of uh, the first towel. So Justin, we will get in contact with you after the fact and make sure you get that uh, limited edition towel that there's only three of in the world and now only, now only two. Um, Allison, <laughs> um, can you speak a little bit about um, the level of scholarships or, or level of play one needs to get a scholarship uh, as the game sits right now? Definitely, and I, I don't think it's really changed all too much um, in terms of amounts of scholarships available from when I played because I still um, remember when I was in high school, a lot of my friends would shoot like in the mid 90s and they were being recruited by schools locally in the Midwest um, to get to a top 25 school. Really, if you had an average under 76, you could get into a top 25 school. And I think my, my scoring average to get into Florida State was probably somewhere between 74 and 76. Um, with a couple of rounds under par. And so that was that was good enough at the time. And now what I think has changed is that in order to get into those top 25 schools, scoring averages are, are literally par or even subpar. Um, Andrea, what was your scoring average as you were looking at UCLA, USC, and Stanford? Do you remember? I think it was around 71. Around so, scratch, yeah. maybe a little under, but... Yeah, definitely not as competitive as it is today, I think. Right, definitely. So I think those top 25 schools are um, have like shifted the bar in order to get into those, um, certainly scoring lower. And then when I look at some of the college um, scores, m the top 25 schools, they're breaking par right and left. And, and in the early 2000s, if you broke par, that was like a big deal. So that certainly changed. But in terms of like the higher scores, those scholarships are still out there. Um, in fact, I have a cool story of a girl who came to me for some coaching um, as a sophomore in high school, and she was in the low 100s. And by the time she was a senior, she had already grasped the idea of like, I, I think I want to get a college scholarship. And she was able to do that. Her scoring average was around 93, 94. She was able to go to a small school on the East Coast, and she's having a great time. She's a collegiate athlete. Um, has some money coming her way and really has the experience of playing in college golf. So I think it's um, really important to share with all levels of, of golfers that there's a place out there for you, particularly in the girls realm, that there are um, Division Three, Division Two, II, Division One, NAIA, there's opportunities to even play, whether they may not give scholarships at certain divisions. There's an opportunity to be a part of a collegiate program, um, which is really cool. So I would, I would, Make sure to encourage your, particularly your girls golfers, um, to not not take the realm of like you're not good enough. That there is a place out there for you. You just have to find the right fit for you. Yeah, now that's super important, and I I, I hope that the the folks that are listening in on this call um, note to self uh, that if you're working with juniors, uh, that that we do have the ability to help shape those kids that aren't the A plus players into scholarships. Um, so we need to do our homework as professionals, make sure we understand what those opportunities look like um, so that as we have students who, who really love and are interested in the game, um, that if we can dangle that carrot out for them that, hey, you know, you don't have to shoot 72 to play golf. If you could, you know, if you really work hard on your game from sophomore to junior to senior year and you're somebody who could even shoot in the mid 80s, that you're potentially eligible if that's something that you're passionate about, um, we need to make sure that we're that we're telling our students that um, because I, I, I would have thought it would have, I mean, if you had asked me that a while ago, where does scholarship begin and end? I would have thought it was low to mid seventies and everyone else is just on, out of luck. So, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're um, conveying that message to our students as an industry. Something, Josh, some interesting as I was trying to find stats back in the old days um, and, and to Allison's point, you know, and, if you could break 80 when I, when I was a junior golfer, I mean, you, you were good. You were going D1. You were going to those top 25 schools. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so again, it's just like, like Allison said, I mean, it hasn't necessarily 
increase by number of schools, although that has happened. Um, it's just the the skill level and the talent level has has dramatically increased, which is which is great. But um, in 1990, which is the year I graduated high school, just shy of a thousand girls uh, or young women play collegiate golf, and now that number is near 2,500. So that's amazing. And, and again, to Allison's point, whether it's D1, 2, 3, NAIA, junior college, um, you know, the opportunities are out there, you know, and if you can utilize golf to, to help you get a, a collegiate uh, college education, um, so great. And, and to Andrew's point, you know, you, you learn to be part of a team, you know, um, that's going to help you no matter what career uh, you decide, career path you decide to, to take. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna move into teaching the game with career in mind. Nikki, if you don't mind scrolling through some of the questions, I'm gonna ask trivia question number two. Um, sure. Maybe we can can find what would be especially as we lead into this next subject. But here we go, folks. Get your okay, fingers ready on. on your keypads. Here we go. Name three of the four women who have played in a PGA tournament event. I don't even know that one. Oh, well, you're not eligible to answer the question. You're a panelist. No, oh, I know, but I can only name maybe two or one. <laughs> you're about to learn. See, this is what you're going to learn today. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so a couple of um. Yep, this Charles. From, uh, Sally. Sorry. Sally Coasters or Sally Coasters. I apologize. Um, I am a coach for one of those lower-ranked D1 colleges. I have been coaching for 15 years, and I do not see the scholarships. Uh, you are talking about. Well, I know that D1 schools, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, each have six full scholarships. So some may choose to give six full rides, some may split that up. Um, maybe, Sally, if you could get a little bit more specific um, on what the question would be and, and whom to direct that to, we appreciate it. Um, how do we find the schools that are looking for golfers that are shooting 85? Um, you know, I think there's there's some great resources out there. Um, uh, the, the Ping College Golf Guide that's been along forever, you know, now it's all online. It used to be this book. Um, that, that's something to refer to because it, it lists every school that offers golf uh, for men and women and sort of gives you an overall view of the academic side of the school, you know, what you need to do to get accepted because that's the first step is to get accepted to the school and um, and then it just lists averages and results from their team. Um, and, it, and it sort of helps you sort of narrow down, okay, where do I fit in? I'm, I'm shooting 80, but I've got a 4.5 GPA, okay? Here, here's a list of schools that would, that would fit you. Um, Ted Gleason, who's another great resource, he's in a lot for us um, on the junior tour, former collegiate coach, um, you know, helps families and helps juniors sort of navigate the process because it, it is a little bit daunting, especially if you're not that taught if you're not the Andrea Lee that's being recruited by you know many schools and, and she can just pick where she wants to go you know there's a lot of kids out there that that's not the case so they sort of have to find they have to do their research research as well um, and, and sort of find the, the right fit uh, John Klein wanted me to mention community college golf John's one of our section members he's the uh, coach at I know I'm going to say it wrong Kuamaka College um, down here in San Diego and John's done a tremendous job uh, with his program down there and and you know that's another opportunity uh, for people you know we mentioned d123 NAIA junior college community college um, the opportunities are, are there and so John thank you for all the wonderful things that you've done I think um, in the, to answer that college recruiting um, and where are those programs at a lot of times the students that I've worked at that have been higher scoring averages and then they've found out scholarships they've reached out to the college first so they've come up with a list of 10 colleges that fit their academic um, rigors and also also offers the degree that they're looking for and then they'll go to that website and see if they offer college golf and then they reach out to the coach and then that that starts the uh, conversation going so it's not like these um, smaller schools are like reaching out to my students my students are finding them on their own through their due diligence and i think that's really important and then also um, a lot of the coaches that are pga members and lpga members sometimes they'll post hey i've got spots on my team do you have any kids that are that are interested 
And so through just word of mouth and networking, I've been able to help place coaches with students that are interested that are some of the higher um, scorers, if you will. Uh, that's great. Um, I'm going to just move us forward here with respect to trying to keep on schedule and time. Uh, teaching the game. Uh, oh, I think we go back there one, Bryce. Uh, and just, um, I think it's just, again, for, for us all to be mindful as instructors. Um, you know, I think I'd mentioned it at the beginning, three of the five um, on our, or three of the six on our state championship team in, in 2015 are, now, are gonna be in the industry somewhere. Um, that there are so many opportunities to, to work within golf um, that we just, uh, Nikki, you can probably speak to it just a little bit more, just with the, with the number of opportunities. If you're somebody who grows up, and I'm sort of just gonna you know, follow the line here, um, this is what we really try to do more than anything at, at, at our Junior Golf Academy is, is instill a love of the game of golf. Playing the game, being around a facility, playing with your friends, challenging yourself to get better, uh, trying to bring the, the family dynamic in to be a positive support, a role, figure out ways to participate in a community so that, so that a, a, a young player has a true love of the experience of playing golf. And when that's there and, and that sits nicely as they progress through life, if they understand, even if they don't pursue it right away, if they understand that there is absolutely a channel and pathway to stay connected to this game as a career, um, the more that we can at least alert these families and kids that it is possible and that there are areas to do that, uh, that then that seed has a better chance to grow. And, and again, I think we're doing a better job of it than we ever have as an industry. Um, and just in, in encourage our professionals to, to be mindful when we're working with people um, as Nikki said, we are really more in the business of raising a better next generation of young people than we are young golfers, um, and and we should keep doing that. Yeah, I think I think it all sort of you know snowballs, right? The 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 growth that we've seen in in junior golf and specifically girls and collegiate golf and you know on and on as that continues to progress, then. Um, the the number of women that we see in our industry will continue to grow, and and it's it's sort of our responsibility, um, myself and Allison, as women in this industry, to to foster that growth and and educate. Um, our section's women's committee, as an example, um, last year decided to to take a step forward in that. We created what we called Girls Night Out, um, and it was specifically for high school girls um, and their parents to come out and and listen to. Um, panel speakers that we lined up from various um, areas of the industry. Some were traditional golf professionals like Ellison, some were in golf administration like myself, some worked for Callaway Golf, um, some weren't in the industry but utilized golf to further their career. Um, so really it's just our job to continue to educate um, young girls, you know, that uh, yes, you may have a job, you may have a dream of, of playing professionally and that's wonderful, but just in case that doesn't pan out, um, you know, here's some opportunities for you in the industry and, and even well beyond, you know, being a traditional golf pro or an instructor, the, the, the opportunities are tremendous, you know, and, and those have grown um, since I was a kid, you know, um, when I was deciding whether to get into the PGA program, as an example, you could only work um, at a green grass facility. And I had just started with the section. You couldn't even work for a section and go through the, the PGM program. So, to see how that has evolved. And now we have 24 different classifications of being a PJ professional. You know, that's that's encouraging. So we will continue to do our job and, and uphold our responsibility of, of educating and um, encouraging our, our young girls and young women to consider uh, a job in this industry because it's already a game they love. Um, so it, it, it makes it a lot easier. Um, Dr. Dr. Allison, Dr. Allison, could you explain a little bit to us uh, um, about motivation, how you use it in your teaching and how important motivation is um, just to get anybody better, anything that they do in life? Yeah, I think it's important to understand the types of motivation, whether it's intrinsic or external and um, making sure that it really fits the personality of the student that you're working with. If you have a student in front of you who just doesn't want to be there, um, it, it's hard to motivate them. It's a challenge. It's difficult. But if you maybe know the interests of the student, if you know things that um, allow them to have fun, maybe they're more interested in video games than they are at golf, but their parents are bringing them to you to get an hour of outdoor activity, 
Um, can you use video games as a motivator? Can you pretend that you're in a video game and make golf feel like it's a video game so you really connect um, with things that they're really interested in? I'm a big fan of using more internal motivators rather than external motivators. So I'm not, I'm not a coach that gives a lot of prizes or um, goodies to students that are coming out for camps or in competitions. I want them to really attach and associate what they're doing as feeling good rather than what they're doing is getting a trophy or getting an award or getting a prize. Some students it works really well with and oftentimes there'll be populations that you have come through your camps that you're like, well, with that kid, if I, if I bet him a dollar, then he's really, really in tune. But if I bet him um, a boost in his self-esteem, then that's not really gonna connect with him. So I completely understand that, but it's also like how you associate um, their progress and their success with. I think when you set small goals, that's also a nice way to help feel uh, that you're progressing. So instead of just looking at, oh, I wanna gain a college scholarship, how about like, what's your weekly goal? What's your daily goal? Can you make five putts in a row? And that's kind of like a ladder going into the next stage of, can you practice for 30 minutes and have fun doing it? Um, can you practice three times this week? And then start to build your way up into those bigger goals. When you chunk up that, those goals into smaller, achievable, um, digestible forms, it's certainly a lot more fun to go out and work on it. So I think when you're trying to motivate your students and motivate your players, you really have to know their personality. You have to know what makes them pick. Um, my, my friends in the PGA, a lot of my women's group, Kim Falcone in particular, she knows that I love cake and she knows I love trophies. So if she's gonna try to motivate me, she's probably gonna say, hey, you wanna win a trophy and celebrate with a piece of cake. Like that's what works for me. But for Andrea, it might be something different. For Nikki, it might be something different. So when you know your student, you can certainly set up some motivating factors and some goal setting um, to make them feel like they're progressing and that they're achieving. Uh, Andrea, in, in your case, um, obviously having been fortunate to watch you practice a whole lot, as a kid, could you speak a little bit to, um, and I know you had said, you know, 80% short game and, and how important the short game is. You were, and we talk about you behind your back all the time. Um, <laughs> when, when you, when Andrea would spend hours as a kid on the putting green doing different drills, little like three, five, seven drills, have to make certain numbers. And I remember one day, and, and I'm not going to be able to remember the exact, but it was like, well, Andrea, what are you doing in this drill? And she's like, well, I have to complete this drill before I leave. And it was something like, you know, five, seven footers in a row from five. I mean, it was something where I was just like, oh, my God, I don't know if I, I could be there for a week and not accomplish it. Um, Andrea, could you speak a little bit to, you know, your own motivation that you put into your practices uh, and how it, and, and what that meant for you? Yeah, um, I was. I was always pretty motivated since I was a little kid. I loved winning. I'm super competitive. Um, both my parents are competitive, so I guess that's where I get it from. Um, but yeah, I love to win. I love to compete. And I think that's what really sparked my motivation to practice. Um, of course, there are days where I was like, dang, I, like, I really don't want to practice. I don't want to do this right now. And on those days, you kind of just got to be like, okay, let me just focus on this one thing and or let me just complete this one drill and then I'll go. Because if the mind's not there, then you're really not putting in the effective practice that you need to, you know, get something out that day. So on those days, I'd, you know, kind of just do one thing and then be done with it. But um, yeah, I, I, motivation is, it's, it's hard if you don't want to, you know, really do something or practice for hours on end. Um, it's really hard to motivate yourself. But I think at the end of the day, if you want to get better and really want to improve on something that you're working on, you know, you, you need to put in the time and you need to put in the effort. And, um, you know, my dad always told me, you know, it's not, it's not the quantity, it's not the hours that you practice, it's the quality. Um, and I think that's really important. And that's what really helps me throughout my career is to, you know, focus on the things that I really need to work on. Um, but, you know, in doing that, you also have to put in the time. So I think really the motivating factors for me was, you know, just to, you know, cut one stroke here and there. And you know, I would set short term goals for myself and long term goals. You know, I want to head into this tournament and, you know, I want to get top five or 
um, you know, I want to reduce my scoring average by however many strokes for the next year, you know, things like that, that um, you just got to set for yourself um, over the course of your junior career or your career, whatever, however you want to improve. I think um, that will really help your motivation and um, will help you, you know, want to have that desire to practice and put in the time to do something. Yeah, um, Allison, from that perspective, um, and I, you know, I try to incorporate this into pretty much everything I do with everybody is is the gamification of of anything and everything that we do. To to your point, whether it's for something that's a, a prize or whatever. I know the PGA Junior League. Someone piped in um, uh, Lloyd here about that. We give the little flags um, to the players so that there's a, a sense of sort of this team thing that that we all get when we do things as a motivator. Um, just the simple playing of games today. Today's kids. I have a I have a son and a daughter, and and they could spend all day on this thing, if if I let them. Different than we've ever seen before. Um, and they're the whole culture of everything that they're doing is a game. They're playing against each other remotely. There's chess, or who could find more frogs, or and it's ridiculous. There is no prize. There is no thing. It's just it's just that they enjoy playing games. And I think from that perspective, if we just made it a game and the kid was interested in playing the game, regardless of the result, just get them playing. And that, and that becomes how we get, that's how we teach, is, is we can fool them into doing what we want them to do while they're just playing the game. Is that, Allison, kind of in line with? That's 100% in line. I mean, you put it in a, in, a, in a great way too. And I think that when you look at how children learn, they learn through discovery and they learn through trial and error. They don't learn really great from necessarily someone telling them what to do. Um, through that self-discovery, through that game playing, it's fun and they're also learning. And so I think if it's appropriate for that age group, um, to, we have to make everything a game for them. And maybe for adults, we should make things more of a game too, because it's awfully a lot more fun. No, that's, that's fantastic. Um, hey, Bryce, can you just jump to the final slide? I know we're gonna run out of time here. There's, there's, uh, a couple of things going on, but the, the very last one, I'm, I'd, I'd like you guys to see if you could just pop this, um, is here's our, here's our game. Here's my, here's my video game for you guys. You're building a junior golfer in a video game. You get to choose two below. Which of these two would you choose for your video game junior golfer and why? Allison, you can go first. Oh, wow. <laughs> this, is a game. this is a game. This is a game. You get, you only get to choose two. <laughs> And why? Yeah, Josh, for games, I like to prepare. So I like to read the rules first. I like to understand. Make it a very on. uncomfortable job. That's Did I mention to you, <laughs> I have a trophy cake in the other room. It's a, a <laughs> very good <laughs> trophy. Um, if I were to pick two, I would say um, resilience, persistence, and work ethic. And then why? Um, I think if you're resilient, <laughs> able to overcome um, any challenge that comes your way and then the work ethic part I think is going to be the motivating factor so if you have the ability to um, overcome failure then you're certainly going to put in the energy and the work in order to be the best player that you can potentially be. Andrew you've now had 35 seconds to prepare for that do you want to choose to? Yeah honestly all these um, aspects are really important I think but if I were to choose two I'd choose the positive attitude and work ethic. Um, just because, you know, throughout my career, I've had, you know, times where my attitude was really bad and I had a really bad mentality and that really affected my game in a negative way. Um, so I think it's really important to always just stay upbeat, no matter, you know, how many over par you're shooting or if you had a bad hole, you just got to get over it and move on. Um, and I think that's really important on the golf course. And then work ethic, um, you know, like Allison said, I think it's just really important to, you know, focus on the things that you really need to work on. And, you know, without work ethic, you're not going to get anywhere. And, and that's kind of, you know, at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to is, you know, how much time and effort are you willing to put in to your game to actually improve? So I think those two for me. All right, Nikki, you're playing NFL 2000 and whatever, and you've got Dak Prescott, you get two, two of these, which ones are you choosing? <laughs> Well, you know, I love quizzes where there's no wrong answer. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go with confidence and positive attitude. I think, um, you know, in anything you do in life, you have to believe in yourself and you have to believe that you can do it. Um, and you also have to have a great attitude. And, and with those two things um, is where a great coach can come in and, and be a great motivator um, to allow you to do some of the other things as well. 
That was fun. We should not do this more often and get back to actually playing golf. Um, I wanted to thank uh, the three of you for, for joining us for this segment today. Really appreciate uh, your time and, and your expertise on, on the subjects. Um, just as a, a quick reminder to everybody who's still listening in, um, I know Ventura County is, is coming online here with respect to the back to the world that we live in. Um, and I'll encourage uh, everybody to uh, let's make sure that we that we're respectful of the rules and really try to not only hold ourselves accountable to following along with what we need to do to, to keep this train rolling in the right direction. Um, but as industry leaders, let, let's encourage others to do the same. It's great that we follow the rules and, and perpetuate what we need to do. Um, if we can share a positive message to others and really in, and encourage us to do this the right way, um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we can get back to playing. So uh, hope everyone is safe and well. Thank you guys so much for your time and uh, we'll see you on the golf course soon. Thank Thanks, you, Josh. Josh. Thanks, Josh.